Welcome to the Cabral Concept, where board-certified naturopath and integrative health practitioner Dr. Stephen Cabral shares how he was diagnosed at the age of 17 with a life-altering illness and given no hope for recovery. It was only after studying and traveling all over the world did he discover how to combine ancient Ayurvedic healing practices with state-of-the-art naturopathic and functional medicine to fully rebalance the body and re-energize it with life. It's time to discover how to get well, lose weight, and finally feel alive again. And now, here's your host, Dr. Stephen Cabral. Welcome back, everyone. Great to have you here today. We are going over episode 2518. If you want to follow along for all the show notes and the three big takeaways, head on over to stephencabral.com forward slash 2518. All right, so I was reading a really interesting post the other day on social media. That is one of the few things that I do like about social media. I don't like all the bickering and complaining or fakeness of social media, but I love the shares. I love the aspirations that people put out there. And I also just enjoy the overall journey that people are sharing online. So I very much like social media for that. Social media for me is one of those kind of get in and get out types of things. I like to read the posts from the people that I enjoy following or or that I may look up on my own. Uh, but I don't hang around too often for the comments. The comments seem to turn into uh, and take on a whole life of their own. But one I wanted to share with you today was an interesting take on the blue zone cultures. So the blue zones, if, if you haven't heard about them before, these are the traditional uh, cultures that have the longest living lifespans. Meaning these are people that are not doing anything specifically, meaning like on purpose to live a longer, healthier life yet they always have been for many, many generations. And maybe to clarify that just a little bit more, is that they are following their own protocol, their own systems, but they're doing that as a way of life, of what they've been handed down from generation to generation, and things that keep them healthy, and maybe less reliant on a lot of the conventional medicine-based interventions that we have today, because these people don't seem to need them in the same way. And although there are many tenants to the blue zones, meaning like, Community is a big one, and movement, which we'll talk a little bit about today. One of the big focus is always on their nutrition. Because if you look at all of the blue zones, meaning like um, the different cultures around the world. So, uh, you know, we have the Okinawan people that that have lived traditionally the longest. We've got people are in Sardinia, um, like all literally all over the world, right? And so when we look at them, we say, okay, none of these cultures are ex- eating the exact same foods, meaning like exactly the same diet. They're not. But they share a lot of similarities. And believe it or not, so I'm... I'm Big on, I like data, I really do. I'm just a fan of trying to make data interesting and not boring, right? But I like to see similarities. So when I was looking up, and I've just always done a lot of uh, debating on, with myself, just like, is this really the best diet? Is this really what's most natural for humans? I always go back to the data, like, what is the anatomical, physiological structure of a human's digestive tract? Okay, In nature, do we see that in any other animals? Okay, do they have the same digestive tract? Do they also have the same tooth? You know, basically molars, incisors, canines, et cetera. Is it the same as ours? Okay, how closely related? Got it. All right, how would that evolve over time? What did human skulls look like millions of years ago? Was it similar? Okay, yes, so it hasn't changed that much. Like, I look at all those different things, and that might be boring to some people, and I totally get it, but that's my job and my interest, and I try to share that with you. And so... It's the same thing with the longest lived people. Although the diets aren't exactly the same, I say, well, what do their macros look like? What's the total amount of carbs per day, protein, and fats? And then out of those macros, what do the, not exactly micros look like, but what do the food groups within the carbs, protein, and fats look like? Because we know that people could have a diet that's 50% carbs, and it could be from vegetables like broccoli and cauliflower and Brussels sprouts, um, or it could be from... Uh, popcorn and cookies and all sorts of other things, right? So like we can look at it from a different perspective. And one person I think who's just, I mean, the originator, one of the original people is Dan Buettner. And I always, uh, I have always apologized to people if I'm not pronouncing the name correctly, but 
And Dan Buettner was one of the originators of really looking at the Blue Zones, obviously he wrote the books called Blue Zones, and did a really nice post and some really nice research on this. I've looked at all the graphs. I've looked at everything basically in general from macros and all that. And it's very interesting, but most of the Blue Zones-based people, the vast majority of their diet actually came from starch and grains. And you might say to yourself, this doesn't make any sense. Like, and, and I get it. Like, that's why I look at it through a skeptical lens. Because in a Western-based culture, in a Western-based mindset, so again, I'm always sharing with you from an unbiased perspective. And I work through all of the problems in my head, just like I'm speaking to them right now, speaking to you right now about them. So, okay, if we think about a traditional starch diet, we're thinking about French fries and pasta and bread and all those things. So I get it, like that's traditionally starch in the Western-based mindset. And so that's often associated with high cholesterol, high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, cancer, like all the things we don't want. So, and, and I would say that's absolutely correct. Okay, so now we look at, but how is it possible then for these traditional cultures that are still eating these foods today to not only not get those diseases at the rates at least that we have them, but they're living 100 years and older, right? So I go deeper, right? Like I don't take it at face value because there's a lot of experts that say, no, it can't be right, it can't be true. But nonetheless, it is true. The people in these blue zones based areas are typically not overweight and they don't suffer from a lot of the diseases of Western based cultures. Okay, so let's look at it. Yes, it is true that about two thirds of their diet is carbohydrate based and oftentimes starch based. And so what does it look like? Well, it looks like ancient grains or potatoes. Now you might say, well, potatoes, that doesn't sound like an overall health-based food. Well, let's go deeper. What type of potatoes are they? All right. Well, we're looking at typically purple potatoes or colorful tubers, like root-based vegetables, not the traditional white potatoes of today. Although I have some really interesting research for you, and I do hope that you tune in. I believe this is going to be next week. Let's just see here. Uh, well, it's going to be over the next couple of weeks. I'm going to share with you some research actually on potatoes and diabetes and how it is not the potatoes themselves, but rather how they're cooked, which leads to higher blood sugar. And it's, so it's fascinating stuff. So please stay, do stay tuned with the overall Cabral concept journey as, as we try to unfold, unfold things every single day. All right, so again, what are they eating? All right, they're eating, yes, the, like the purple potatoes, right? Different colored potatoes and yams, brightly colored, could be orange, could be purple, could be yellows, great. So that's part of the diet. What else, what about these ancient grains? All right, well the ancient grains can be things like farro, quinoa, uh, barley, brown rice, oatmeal, cornmeal, bulgur wheat. Okay, these are things that they've traditionally eaten that are often stone ground, loaded with minerals, obviously non-GMO, not sprayed with pesticides. Okay, these are traditionally farmed. And so, and again, keep in mind the wheat that's been hybridized is a little bit different than the wheat that we're talking about there. And again, it doesn't mean that I don't think that the Blue Zones diets could even be improved to even a greater degree, right? Like there's, I'm not saying that at all, but I'm saying it's like, let's take what works, start to look at that, maybe not adopt it fully, but what can we make of it? All right, so we know that, interesting, right? That's, that's the majority of their diet. But let's go, let's go a little bit deeper. So they also include a couple tablespoons of nuts every single day, most of these cultures. And it could be, again, it could be walnuts, it could be pecans, it could be almonds, a couple of nuts a day in their diet. Now, that's predominantly fat. However, there is also a good portion of carbohydrates. All right, so they're getting some of these nuts in there. So now, between the nuts and between the starches, we're getting a lot of dietary fiber. We're getting some omega-3s potentially from those nuts. And we're getting a lot of these protective polyphenols in those two plus their fruits and vegetable intake. So let me just share with you some stats. Blue Zones got somewhere between five and 10 servings per day of fruits and vegetables. All right, so this is according to the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. People who ate, people who ate five fruits and vegetables a day, lived an extra three years comp compared to their non-plant eating counterparts. Eating seven or more portions of fruit and veggies a day can lower your risk of premature death by a whopping 
6%, according to a study published in the Journal of Epidemiology and Community Health, right? So now they're getting even more fiber from their fruits and vegetables brightly colored, right? So let's just look at it this way. The preponderance of their diet is made up of brightly colored fruits, vegetables, and let's just say root vegetables and or starches. Now, does this mean you need to eat exactly like this? No. And I would actually caution people that have not been eating their whole life like this, because we'll get to that in a moment, of why it may not work for you in the very beginning. But here's where they did avoid, right? So they got good fats from some fats that they used, such as olives and olive oil. They use some animal protein, so they get healthy fats there, again, from a healthy animal. And there's some eggs, there's different, different items like that, although it was a smaller part of their diet. Why don't I share that with you right now? So it's interesting. The longest-lived people in the world didn't consume more than 5 to 10% of their diet from protein on average. So on average, you might say it's around 10%. Now, you might say that's a very low number, and I don't disagree with you. That's a pretty low number. And the thing is, though, and I've talked about this, so I'm not going to go too in-depth, it keeps IGF-1 levels lower. It keeps overall hormonal levels from getting too high in certain areas. Again, I know there's checks and balances, obviously, within the body and how the liver works, etc. cetera. Uh, but it also keeps their overall fats a little bit lower, too. And again, I know that there's debates over this. I'm not going over that debate today. I totally get it. I'm sharing with you what the longest-lived people did. That's all, okay? So when you look at that, let's say they ate 2,000 calories a day, 10% of that is 200 uh, calories, right? We divide by four, it's about uh, 50, 50 grams of protein. Not a lot of protein. I'm not saying that you eat that little, right? But I'm just sharing with you what they did. And I've done studies, I've, not my studies, sorry. I've done research on studies that have showed you that you really don't want to go over 19 to 20% maximum of your uh, diet from protein. If you want to live a long, healthy life. Now, if you want to body, tra- if you want to do body transformation, get an amazing shape, and that's your main focus, then you should go higher in protein, lower in certain other factors. I've talked about that on other shows. So it's just for the people who are looking to live a long, healthy life, and they're willing to create some compromises here and there. All right, because I think you can be in great shape and live a long, healthy life. Okay, so here's what they avoided, though. They avoided sugar sweet beverages. Okay, so they often did some coffee in the morning. And they might add some natural raw sugar to that. That's the extent. Every once in a while, they would bake pies or natural fruit-based desserts. So no processed drinks or processed sugary treats. There was no candy. There was no real cookies. Um, They made certain like biscuits, things like that sometimes. But these things were not on a daily occasion. They also did not add a lot of salty snacks. So although there's plenty of studies associating sodium with obesity and type 2 diabetes. The truth is, most of the salt is associated with processed foods, and it's the processed food in general. So you can't just blame the salt. Now, again, you have to take in lots of fruits and vegetables, or salt does cause an issue, because there has to be a balance between sodium and potassium. But again, that's not today's show. So do keep in mind that a high-sodium diet is not healthy, unless you also have a high potassium diet, all right? Like that's just, that you, have to, you have to stay balanced. And so the problem is most processed foods have salt added to them because when you add carbohydrates, let's say sugar, with salt and fat, that is how you get someone addicted to a certain food. The salty, the sweet, and the fat, that's the most addicting thing really for human taste buds, right? Because that adds a lot of fat to the body and the body's programmed actually to add a lot of weight and that would help it during times of Famine, right? During times of not a lot of food. Okay, so, and they also avoided processed meats. This is a really important one because I see a lot of people out there just like, get in your protein no matter what, if it fits your macros, et cetera, et cetera. And they're eating lots of processed meat. A lot of the keto and carnivore people, they, they're just not t- teaching people about health. It's simply about body transformation and eating meat and that's it. But again, this has been known now for well over 30 years. It's one of the top 10 carcinogens. If you're putting processed meat into your body, I mean, the the risks of colon cancer and other types of cancers go way up. It's literally in the same category as smoking. It's a disaster. So now you ask, how do the Blue Zones people eat so many starches or carbohydrates? Well, when you look at it, their their diet was essentially at a caloric deficit or it was break even with what they needed for the day. 
it was mainly starches, not high fat and not high protein. So when we look at that, we're not mixing, and this is gonna, I'm gonna be doing plenty of shows on this, and I have an, another show, which I'll link up today at stephencabral.com forward slash 2518, as to why carbohydrates don't cause diabetes. They just don't. Like it does not cause diabetes. Now, processed food, that's a different story. But are we talking about processed food or are we talking about carbohydrates? Because when you process foods, like let's think about this. What are your high carbohydrate foods, right? Cookies and let's think about it. Um, crackers and you're mixing in maybe popcorn and like think of all those processed foods, right? They're, we think of them as high carbohydrate foods. I don't disagree. They're high carbohydrate foods. But guess what else they're also in? High in fat. Now, am I blaming fat? No. But when you mix sugar and fat together, you're going to create inflammation in the body and weight gain. So when you're talking about the Blue Zones-based diet, they're not mixing a lot of fat with their carbohydrates, right? So they're getting these meals that are easier to digest. And again, I can't go through every parameter today like, well, what about your continuous glucose monitor as it goes up after a meal? Okay, a couple things about that, but I can't go over that in depth. I've, I've done that on other shows. I'll do it in the future. Is that first of all, one of the reasons why people's blood sugar spikes after a meal, especially with carbohydrates, is that, well, one, there's a normal spike after a meal in blood sugar, right? And when I say spike, it, my, I, well, elevation is probably a better word, right? Because I give you the parameters. I've talked about that before on a continuous glucose monitor. That's not abnormal. It actually helps to reset cortisol levels, leptin levels, ghrelin levels, and thyroid. So when we're always trying to stay baseline the whole day, maybe helpful, maybe not. I'm not talking about elevated levels of glucose throughout the day. That, of course, is not healthy. What keeps your levels of glucose elevated for a longer period of time? When you mix fat and you mix sugar together, right? It's not ideal. The other thing is this. The Blue Zones people are incredibly active. So we've talked about this many times, but when you are walking and constantly moving, doing your chores, doing your tasks, gardening, et cetera, you are not getting that high elevation of blood sugar. You're getting a normal elevation that comes back down. So they are burning calories, they are using that glucose as fuel for their body. It's easy to digest. They're not converting it over to the body fat that you may think. And again, you can look at the Blue Zones people. They're not overweight. And so I've done this, I've talked about this on a couple of shows. It's like how not to add body fat. Well, create a deficit in your glycogen stores, how your body stores carbohydrates. If you lower your glycogen stores and you eat carbohydrates, it fills those stores and it doesn't add body fat, right? So it's just something to think about. But the Blue Zones people, they were active, right? Enjoyed their meals, ate their meals, ate them slowly, followed a principle that most long-lived people do, eat until 80% full, not completely stuffed, go for a short walk, have a digestive aid after your meal, don't overdo. And so when you look at that, it allows you to begin to at least let your, your mind go and start to think about that Maybe you're able to eat a well-balanced, healthy diet, not be overly restrictive if you're following a whole food nutrition plan and you're not overeating, right? So you have plenty of space between meals, you follow a normal overnight intermittent fast, and you enable your body to eat easily digestive foods seen in nature. You keep your body moving, getting your 10,000 steps per day, and you begin to get all these phytonutrients in, plus your steps and your movement, and all of a sudden, all of your risk factors for early mortality and early death go down. And I've quoted this before, but if you don't get heart disease, you don't get high blood pressure, you don't get type 2 diabetes, and you don't get cancer, which, by the way, all of those are preventable. Cancer, as I've always said, is the wild card because you need to know what's going on inside your body. Then you're going to likely live at least another 10 years. So if you do that, an average life expectancy is 75 to 77, 74 to 78, depending on the year, well, then you're up already up to 88 years old, 87 years old, right? So now you can start to see how these, and that's just a blended average, you can start to see how these blue zone-based cultures live a long, happy, sustainable life. So hopefully today's show was helpful. Again, if there's any questions or comments, feel free to leave them below. Or my team and I are always happy to get back to you. And if the show was helpful, do feel free to share it with anyone you believe it could serve. All the show notes today, all the links, uh, as well as Dan Butner's post will be at stephencabral.com forward slash 2518. 
Did you know that the body really only becomes sick or unbalanced in only two ways? Over time, you become deficient in vital nutrients and you also accumulate toxins internally and from the environment. As those nutrients diminish and you increase your total toxic load, your body then begins to show the first signs of dis-ease. It's actually quite predictable and the good news is that if we know how you began to fill up that proverbial rain barrel, we also know how to empty it to begin the healing process. I was fortunate enough to learn this ancient healing process from my mentor after suffering from debilitating diseases for close to a decade. It was only when I began to implement these techniques did I finally overcome my illnesses and go on to live a life of energy and vitality that I now enjoy. I'd like to share with you now what I discovered after traveling all over the world and how to combine the best of ancient healing wisdom with state-of-the-art science. Allow me to teach you exactly how I've been able to help over a quarter of a million people to empty their rain barrel and begin to transform their body and lives into what they've always hoped they could be. To get your copy of the international bestseller, The Rain Barrel Effect, simply go to stephencabral.com forward slash rain barrel.